to this session called Towards a Unified Model for Language Learning. My name is Alessio and I'm going to be your host today. So I am originally Italian. I've been studying languages all of my life. I've attended a German school as a kid and ever since I've fallen in love with language learning. I study seven, I speak seven at the moment and I continuously study new ones. I studied Dutch earlier on this year and now studying Japanese. Um, my background is in economics and business. I founded a few companies before, worked with uh, technology businesses and I'm particularly passionate about the psychology of learning and innovation, which are two of the topics that obviously given my profession and my interests, um, I've spent most of my time in, in the last 30 years or so. I am the founder of Tutor.ai. Now, we are a company dedicated to making language learners more effective, to promote independent language learning and helping language learners finding their own personal way to uh, fluency. So today I'm gonna, I'm particularly excited actually to be here because actually this journey started two years ago when I was sitting in the audience, in the physical audience at the Polyglot Conference in Ljubljana and I was uh, listening to all these amazing speeches by these great people and I got so inspired about, you know, this community that I decided I wanted to do something about it to help us improve how we all learn languages and how we can teach languages to other students. Um, and that's why we're here. So today I would like to talk to you um, a bit about how we can become better learners. And the presentation is going to be about 20 minutes and it's divided in four steps. Uh, the first one is um, a bit of an overview about the status of the language learning, the online language learning industry today. Um, the second part is going to be then going a bit into some data that uh, we have collected the tutor around language learning and what language learners typically struggle with. From there we will then go into the topic of how uh, personal preferences play a role in language learning and finally come to kind of the holy grail about this unified model for language learning, uh, which is obviously a bit of a provocative statement, um, but I thought it's, uh, it's an interesting one to put out there and I'd like to hear your thoughts then in the end. So let's get going. So first of all, let's frame the topic here. What are we talking about? So we love independent language learning. We're talking primarily about independent language learning. How is that different from other types of language learning? Well, it's essentially about being self-directed and it's about learners taking learning in their own hand. And that's why we love it so much because ultimately learning is a process where you need to empower yourself to change yourself and learn new things. And really the mindset that you wanna have is an empowered mindset where you decide how, what you need to do uh, to progress. So the whole presentation is going to be really focused around this, this key idea, this core idea, which is that we, any language learner, regardless whether they're studying in a language school um, with books at home, with apps or whatever way they use, but they should try to be better independent language learners. And so what's great and why this section is called the golden age of polyglots is that there's never been so many resources to learn languages as there are today. Now this is one possible segmentation of the language learning industry. Uh, there are many, I've counted hundreds of language learning apps and obviously now we're only talking about apps, not mentioning all the uh, books and uh, you know, study groups and Facebook groups and all sorts of things and YouTube channels, not to mention YouTube channels obviously that are out there. So there's really a lot of ways to learn languages, some more automated, some more face-to-face um, -face with interactions. Um, and that's really great. And even more than that, there are more innovations coming out all the time. Now, if we look at the trends for language learning and what we can expect in the next few years, there is a lot of uh, stuff coming from adaptive learning. So how to basically adapt the curriculum on how you're learning a language to your actual results on how you're scoring and you know, personalizing the lessons to augmented reality or virtual reality you know, on how to create these blended experiences. Um, cross-platform tools, so we all learn with different tools from 
apps to books and uh, w whatever you know um, each one of us learns differently uh, and so we want to have ways to basically continue the learning regardless whether we're sitting in front of a computer or with our mobile phones or with no technology device at all um, micro learning i mean having micro missions to learn and fit them into our busy schedules and a bunch of other stuff but i guess the key message here is the fact that there is no lack of fantastic innovations coming out and innovative companies really doing their best to make sure that we can learn languages uh, more eff eff efficiently and uh, effectively than before and yet if we look at the broader picture 95 percent of language learners an estimated 95 percent since actual figures are difficult to get in this field but a very very high percentage miss their learning goals nevertheless so there is a lot of innovation and a lot of tools out there but still many language learners fail to achieve the goals and the levels that they are looking for that's quite puzzling and that's where our research started and that's why we went out to actually ask language learners what do they struggle with the most and so I want to I wanna stress out that the research that I'm going to show to you, it's a commercial type of research. It's not an academic research. What it means is that it doesn't have such, such stringent requirements as to how we sample people and so on. It, it's, I think it's nevertheless, it gives some interesting insights, but I want you to keep it in mind. Um, and where it starts is that we have a sample, uh, a population of 578 respondents. Uh, so that was a number that we've collected throughout the last two months um, so it wasn't set like from the beginning so that's why I wanted to make this disclaimer so many of the things that you see were really things that surprised us as well so we didn't really start out with a strong assumption and saying hey this is what we want to test we really wanted to go out and get feedback from language learners and understand how it can help them and so we interviewed 578 respondents um, through an online questionnaire and then some qualitative interviews with a uh, subsample of 20 of them. Uh, the questionnaires, the learners that we have interviewed, they have been studying 41 languages, levels from the very beginner to actually fluency, C2. Uh, the vast majority of them was between 25 and 44 in age and has been studying whatever the language they were studying for about 2.2 years and they were living in North America and Europe. This is just because of how we, uh, you know, we sample the population. Um, so just keep it in mind when you look through the results, um, which is good to know. So what turns out is that actually the key issue that most language learners have is not grammar or pronunciation or, you know, speaking with native speakers, which is actually a very big problem but actually even more than that language learners are confused on how to learn best on how to find a direction in language learning let me see if I can move the bubble here on how to find direction in language learning and how to find you know to keep progressing uh, making progress in their studying um, so you know when asked about the biggest obstacle there was the answer of 29 percent of respondents uh, closely followed by practicing with native speakers and then finding the timing and interesting materials. Um, what I want to focus on is this aspect of you know finding direction in learning, knowing what to learn, because it's something that turned out you know it's kind of understandable if you think about the entry level, someone that begins studying a new language, but it turned out that it's something that actually stays there for quite a while. So even intermediate learners, learners that self-reported at the level of P1. Uh, B1 and even B2, on uh, like 27.3% of them, they answered that that was their biggest challenge. So I think that's, that's interesting because, you know, moving one step back to what we were seeing before, so we have a lot of innovations coming in on how we can learn a language, but when and if the key issue is not to know what to do because there are so many resources out there, then it's really hard to make good use of those resources. So what else did we find out? So we have also uh, gotten a few other answers. The first one is about the uh, slow perception of progress. So more than 80% of uh, test responders have reported 
really little or no progress in the last three months, which is kind of interesting and important. And if you connect it with the second point about irregular learning patterns, um, it kind of gives quite a clear picture. So what does irregular learning pattern mean? I mean, as I've written there in the slides, it took an average of 20 plus months to language learners to reach an A2 level. And that's quite a long time to reach an uh, upper, in, upper beginner level. And A2, just for clarification, right, A1 is beginner, A2 is kind of upper beginner, and then you go to B1, B2, C1, and C2 where you have fluency. Um, and that just, the explanation thereof is simply that, and that's something that we validated through qualitative interviews, the most language learners, and it's very normal, you go through waves of learning, right? You, you pick up the language, you're very motivated, and motivation drops off, you don't really learn for a while, then you start again, and so on. And then obviously, in those, in that context, your progress slows down quite a bit. Um, and that's also going back to the point number one, where you make sense, you know, in the last three months, most people haven't really made progress. So what the broader picture that gives you is then when someone, you know, says, yes, I'm learning a language, very often they're actually in a stage where they're not really learning, but they identify with someone that is learning a language, but they're not doing something proactively necessarily about it. Point number three, lack of motivation. Connected to the two points, obviously, 8% uh, of, uh, of respondents to the question before about their biggest obstacle uh, mentioned other in terms of the biggest obstacle. Uh, in this 8%, lack of motivation was the single most mentioned issue that they had. Um, and finally, creating habits. Uh, now, creating habits is something that we, we, you know, we all know it's important not only for language learning, even if you want to go to the gym or anything, you need to create healthy habits around that. And not surprisingly, creating habits was more of an issue for uh, beginners than for intermediate learners. Um, but still, one important point that uh, uh, was in common with many language learners, many language learners had in common struggling with these creating habits and making time for learning, really. All right, so there are many similarities, uh, yet we all learn differently. So we've seen how you know language learners sh share many of the of the struggles, uh, but how do we reconcile that with the fact that we all learn differently and like to learn differently? Because that's very important as well, and that's part of the lack of motivation when we, um, you know find materials that are not engaging or uh, repeat the same lessons over and over again. And so that's something where I would like to offer here again, sorry with this bubble, let me just get out and move it for you. So this is another of the key questions that we were asking ourselves at Tuto and you know, we started looking, and that's a bit, I have to say, kind of uh, my uh, professional lens coming from the, the world of business. There is one model that is called the MBTI model. It's a personality test that is very used in management. And, it's, uh, and it offers one lens to be able to reconcile the differences in preferences and personalities with people within a model that can help you, um, from a practical perspective, to work more efficiently in groups and understand how people click, how they work best. So the MBTI model specifically is a model that has four dimensions and for each dimension you can rate you know, on a scale that goes from you know, super extroverted to introverted, for example when you talk about energy, um, when we talk about the information, how you acquire information, you can be someone that is very um, strong on sensing and acquiring information through details and sensing or intuition like looking at the big picture. Uh, when you look at the decision level it's about how you tend to make decisions is this mo mostly through your thinking or are you someone that needs to feel the decision before moving forward and finally lifestyle. So is it, are, are you do you tend to be someone that is quite judgmental about things and just, you know, you see something and straight away you know where this is going and you know what to make out of it or someone that is more perceiving and always sees opportunities and leaves things open? Um, this, you know, th this is a very interesting framework and if you, if you think about like these four dimensions and, you know, the two extremes, it basically allows you to 
put personalities and uh, put people and cluster people into one of 16 profiles, right? And, um, but let me just go one step back and just make an example so you have a better feeling of what, it's <clears throat> what it really means. So if you have a look at this picture, one classic example to explain what uh, the MBTI test would, would, would tell you is to ask you or ask yourselves to describe what you see in the picture here. And if you take a few seconds to, to look at that and just, you know, formulate a few words in your mind, um, some of you might be saying things like, yeah, sure, I mean, I see, I see kids, I see actually one, two, three, four, five, six kids, I see two parents, I see the fireplace, um, you know, I see candles and so on. Um, some other of you might probably say, well, I see a cozy family around the fireplace, um, probably around Christmas, and, you know, a happy family. Like those are, for example, two extremes um, where in the first case I would uh, tell you, or the test would tell you, where you're probably more of an observant person, someone that perceives reality starting from the details and then piecing the picture together, whereas if you answer it more alongside the, uh, you know, Christmas carol, then you're an intuitive thinker, more likely, someone that tends to perceive reality based on big pictures. And, you know, in, in the context where it was initially developed or it's nowadays used of management, it's a lot about how do you help teams work better together and how do you deliver information and give information in a more effective way so that everybody can sort to speak, speak their own language. What's interesting for us here is that you can use the same model to develop learners profiles so based on how you score on these you know on this on these scales um, you will you, you know you can end up in one of these buckets so to speak and that bucket might give you some idea on how you might be you know what type of learner you might be uh, for example here you have a ISTJ which will be someone that is more introverted more observant so observes and takes in the details uh, more oriented towards thinking, making decision by thinking rather than feeling, and more judgmental, uh, so perceiving kind of the, wor the world in a more clear and structured way. Uh, that would be, from a learning perspective, uh, a systematic type of learner. Um, ISFJ, which is a similar profile, but more makes decision uh, based on feeling rather than thinking, a deliberate learner, and so on. And that's how we developed these, uh, these suit of different learning profiles. Now, what is important to point out at this, at this stage is that obviously you can't put humanity into 16 boxes and this is not predictive as to how, in this case, you're going to learn a language. This is more of an exercise to tell you what, based on the answers you gave, are your preferences, are your explicit preferences around learning. So it can help you reflect around your learning process and help you understand if that's really how you like to learn a language and, and find different ways so that you can become an effective learner. So, um, you know, by no means is that uh, supposed to tell you how you should be learning. Uh, take it more as a, as a help, as an additional tool to help you understand how you might want to consider learning best. Um, these are two examples of how these profiles can actually become more concrete and give you, uh, you know, concrete aid into your everyday learning. So, for example, here you have one profile which is about adaptive creativity, um, sorry, systematic learner, where each, so each profile, sorry, let me go one step back, but each profile then has a learning strategy connected to it. So, for example, for systematic learners, as you see there, adaptive creativity is the main strategy. For exploratory learners, which you see on the right, as a second example, conceptual exploration uh, would be the best strategy. And for each strategy, then you have a set of tips that uh, you might want to consider. So for example, again, for systematic learners, it's about setting a clear objective, creating your own study routine, uh, stick with one approach, investing in building your foundation, and then repeating, repeating, repeating which is completely different, for example, for exploratory learners, where it's a lot more about engaging with your materials, making sure that rather than having very clear, you know, high-level goals, you, you, you keep engaging and you keep engaging the process. You need to explore more with materials. Um, 
you want to immerse yourself in order to memorize and having a tutor or someone to talk to about your learning process might help you so that you can explore more and, and you know create more options around your learning and it's the same way having a study group where you can discuss your learning that might really help you um, there's always a lot more about these profiles but that's just to give you an idea how you can get from very abstract kind of profiles personality profile and then learning profiles to more concrete uh, learning advice on how to structure your learning. So, okay, so I really love this quote and I think that's very true in many things in life, including these models that we're seeing now. Um, and I want to go back to it, so I mentioned it before. These are not strategies and frameworks that are meant to tell you how reality is and how you should be learning. These are models and all models are wrong, right? Including these ones. But some models are useful. They help us see things from a different light and help us consider different options. And I think that's really important here because it was a very good theoretical exercise that we've done too far, but now we need to really see how to make it actionable, right? So we've seen that there is a wealth of learning resources out there in the market. Uh, theoretically, we can all find, you know, amazing ways and every year that passes even more amazing ways to learn languages. Uh, we have seen from other language learners that finding direction in one's own study is often an issue. And we have come up with some profiling techniques in order to help language learners identify what might be good options to explore for them. Now the question really is, okay, how can we make it very actionable for language learners so that they can make the most out of it and they can really uh, get good value and become better learners in the model. So how do we do that? So there are many le learning methodologies out there and many models uh, that have been developed by far smarter persons than myself, people than myself in the market. And so I just want to put this out there as a disclaimer first. So the idea is really not to uh, kind of make models compete is rather to come up with something that is high level enough um, to be able to encompass the methodologies that are out there so that we as language learners can really just have one simple concept in mind that we can always go back to and think about and that can help us uh, reflect as to whether we are you know what we're struggling with and whether we're going uh, in the right direction with our learning. And that's a bit, and now I'm going to move myself for the third time, I think. This is uh, very good fun. Um, this is where I would like to suggest this simple model, which has been permutated from essentially from coaching. And it's really a simple framework, right? When you when you think about your learning and thinking about the issues that we mentioned before, so you can think of effective learning as a combination of actionable goals, engaging activities, tailored resources, and empowering habits. So there is a lot more to that if you go deeper into each one of these areas, but really in the end it's about having actionable goals, things that you know you want to achieve that are concrete enough that you can act on, engaging activities, activities that you like to do, that you want to spend your time on, that it doesn't feel like you're dragging your feet to do it and it's actually motivating to do it, tailored resources, so resources that fit with the activities that you found for yourself so that when you want to do a certain thing and you're, for example, sitting in the subway, you have some resource there that allows you to do that activity and it's not a blocker for you. And finally, empowering habits, which is the foundation of any uh, continuous growth over time. You need to make sure that you embed those good habits and those good activities that you're doing into a, you know, a routine for some people. People that don't like routines is simply uh, triggered actions that allow you to keep the learning going over those 20 plus months that uh, we mentioned before learners typically take to reach even an upper beginner level. So um, this, this is very small here in the presentation. So this, uh, this is an example of what such a plan would look like for a learner. And now I just want to, you need to follow me a bit more by voice because it's probably too small to see, but I wanted to give you some examples of, of what it really uh, means uh, concretely. So this is a plan 
uh, that I did a while ago for my own Japanese studying, right? And so when you're talking about, when I was thinking about my actionable goals, so the first thing is to be realistic about what are actionable goals? What time do we have in the next 30 days? So actually one step back, this plan is for 30 days, right? So just to make it simple, it's for the next 30 days. Then I need to start thinking, all right, next 30 days, um, how much time do we really have to spend on studying? And not only time, like physical time, but mental time. Um, especially, you know, in the beginning, you need to allocate quite some time to it. And thinking about my, my learning time, which is uh, conceptual, exploratory, you know, forget about the profiles for a second, but I know through experience that's how I like to learn. I like to get lost in different materials. So you also need to uh, allow for more time around those things. So how do I make goals that fit into my schedule for the next 30 days? And, you know, some things are very trivial, things like, you know, I want to learn 200 new words or I want to finish, you know, these uh, chapters in the Genki workbook. Uh, some other things are more uh, kind of, uh, if you may, stretches. I know from the beginning of learning a language and when I'm really in the zone, so to speak, that I dream in that language. I, I keep really thinking in that language while I'm waking up in the morning. And that's a state that I know I can put myself and that is really empowering for me. And so that's something I also want to put in my goals. So that's an example of empowering and for, of actionable goals. Thinking about the second area, so on the top right, engaging activities, all right, so, well, what are things that I really love to do regardless of my Japanese learning? Um, I like literature, I like history, how can I, you know, how can I make sure that I can do some activities even with my basic level of Japanese where I can learn more about Japanese history in a way that maybe connects me more and makes me more motivated to learn the language. At the same time, as you see there are four quadrants there, um, it's also about things that I know work for me when I learn a language, things that I know I want to achieve, so they really motivate me to go one step further, and things that I know I need to learn because I need to learn, learn them next. Now your question at this point might be, how do you know all of these things? Well, you don't really know them in the very beginning, you know them over time, you learn about them over time. And the, really the, the idea here is to put them down explicitly so that you can develop on that knowledge for yourself over time. Um, and so uh, going back to the bottom right, you have tailored resources. So that's another area where based on the activities that I have come up with on the, in the quadrant before, I think about all of the learning apps and books and resources that I've used in the past and just cluster them and see which one I like to use, which one I know haven't been effective in this case for me, and which one are connected with what activities. And once I have that planned out as well, I can move them to the empowering habits, which is really something that, as I mentioned before, especially for beginners, is something that many people struggle with. And, um, you know, I think it's obviously it's an illusion to think that there is a magic wand that will solve all of your learning uh, language learning issues, um, but uh, it's important if you want to make time to realize that every day will always only have 24 hours and so to have time you need to make time. So you need to push out some of the bad habits that you have and to start building some new habits. And that's sort of like a, here you see in the file a simple framework to uh, start going around that. Um, for example, you know, I know that when I'm not motivated at work anymore at some point, I might be slacking off and going to social media or just checking the newspaper and things like that. So building a trigger in my mind where it's like, all right, well, I want to slack off. Well, not doing that might be hard for me to do, but at least if I do that, let me just, you know, go on my, uh, like my, my deck and study some new words for five minutes. Then I will still do another five minutes or whatever crap I'm doing anyway, but at least I put something useful in there. So that's a bit the idea about this, around this. Um, so that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you today. And I think the key message, thinking back especially about this last slide that I went a bit more into detail in, is that language learning is a journey. And having a good map really helps. At least it helped in my case. I think it helped many other learners. Now, you can build the map in any way you want, but it's important that you have a, like a perspective and you're in control of your learning, connecting to what we were saying in the beginning about being a good independent learner. And that starts really from understanding your personal preferences. 
Now, it's, uh, it's a lot about self-reflection, it's a lot about experience. There are some tools out there, we at Tutor try to give you tools to do that, uh, but it's really there that you need to start to understand what works for you. And then from there, you can organize your learning into a cohesive study plan, into something that you can go back every time that you feel you need the extra motivation, every time that you need to uh, you know, understand what to do next, and so that you can solve that issue that we mentioned that many language learners have about finding their own direction. From there, then you can go into a regular assessment of your own progress. And that's super critical as well, especially for the motivation piece that we talked about. I mean, obviously, if you don't feel you're going anywhere, it's going to be very hard to motivate yourself sitting down and, and you know, studying. And so that's also where the plan should be built in such a way that allows you to assess your progress and assess it in time so that you don't get to the end of the 30 days and say, oh, I'm a terrible learner but actually on a daily basis, ideally, you look at that and if something doesn't work from an empowered stance, from an empowered perspective, you look back at your plan and if things are really not working for you, you change the plan. So you don't come from a victim mindset, but really you change the plan. That's, that's very important. And that's finally the last point, which is about the fact that it's your job as a language learner to become better over time and there's no way around it and you need to build resilience into your language learning journey. And resilience means that every challenge you encounter, every step you go forward, you don't stick to what you are doing, but you improve what you are doing. You become better. And that's really the key for long-term uh, language learning. And I think that's the, uh, the key message I wanted to give you today. And, uh, you know, I hope that was helpful. And I hope that was also helpful for all the um, expert language learners that are there in the audience, all the polyglots, the, you know, language coaches and language teachers, because we're, we're building this model whereby we want to use learners' data to help them learn more effectively by adopting data in these models and the methodologies available out there to help learners find their own path and we really need your help to uh, make the learning journey better together for all learners out there. So please get in touch, you have my email there. I hope you enjoyed the session and I'll be looking forward to receive your emails and be in touch soon. Thank you.